last week, the theme for May is honoring memory. With the affirmation we shared this morning, let's say it again. We are now and forever one more one in the love of God. Let's try that again. We are now and forever more one in the love of God. Of course, honoring memories involves first and foremost acknowledging that our memories are not the actuality of our lives, but rather the cumulative echo of our life experiences. In other words, our memories represent our often selective and always limited perspectives on our experience of the past about which we create stories that become our realities, even as others hold different memories and realities about the exact same events. As we all know, that there are as many diverse interpretations of any given event as there are people present and participating in the event, not to mention the adjunct memories that are created by the sharing and passing down of stories with others, right? How many of us have, I know I do, I have childhood memories that really aren't my memories. They're the memories of the stories I was told about things that happened to me or that I did as a child. And they feel as real as if they were my own memories. And yet what I know is they've actually come through others' perceptions. Understood in light of our unity principles, we recognize memories as being particularly powerful thoughts held in mind that can and do produce after their kind. In essence, they attract or create reinforcing, self-fulfilling expectations, attitudes, beliefs, and convictions. So as we have new experiences, we fit them into this matrix of memories and beliefs that we already have. So just as we need to regularly and mindfully review and choose the thoughts we hold in mind, so too we need to regular, regularly and mindfully review and choose the memories we allow to become encoded in our consciousness. Specifically checking them against our life defining five basic unity principles as the easiest way to look at it, which include God is, meaning there's only one presence and one power, God the good, expressing always as love. The second one, I am, a divine expression of the one presence and one power, a spiritual being having this human adventure. The third is I think, made in the image of God as divine mind and creative source, I create my reality through the thoughts and memories that I hold in mind. Number four is I pray, as an expression of God, I am inherently and directly connected to and with God through prayer and meditation. And finally, I do. Striving to be increasingly awake, I align and live my daily life according to these principles of truth. So how many of you have ever taken the time to have memories, especially disturbing memories come up, and lay them against these principles? So that you reevaluate reconsider that in light of what we understand to be the truth, it puts a whole different perspective, perhaps, on those memories. Helps us understand them, helps us expand, helps us forgive and recognize that others have perceptions different than ours. So including as we revisit and review these life memories, especially, again, those that are sources of sufferings, we then are able to look through the lens of understanding of these truth principles and also with the assurance that we are now and forevermore one in the love of God. So if we have memories of feeling abandoned or alone, we need to put it back into this that that was the experience we had as that child, but the truth we know is that we are now and forevermore one with the love of God, so we're never truly alone. There's actually a tremendous amount of research about memories physiological and psychological, individual and collective, and conscious and unconscious, including how they inform who we are and how we view the world. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna be exploring this intriguing capacity of ours that is both individual and our collective memory from a few different angles. This morning, we're gonna be looking at gratitude is the memory of the heart through the lens of Mother's Day. Next week, we're going to be looking at how our memories define us and we define our memories. And the final week, we're going to be looking at how collective memories inform our collective consciousness and the role we play in that process. 
So today's <coughs> lesson. I really love today's daily word, motherly love, and the affirmation that with, went with it. I give thanks for the motherly love of God in all its human expressions. I love it because it helps us look beyond the varied skill levels of our particular earthly mothers, or ourselves as mothers, to recognize, remember, celebrate, and be grateful for the motherly love that comes to us from a whole variety of sources, as well as the motherly love that we can cultivate and share with others beyond any children of our own, such that we become one more avenue of motherly love expressing in the world. And because it offers a per perfect example about how we can view memories, specifically today those triggered by Mother's Day, whether they are painful or joyous, through the lens and with the understanding, again, that we are now and forevermore one in the love of God. That's a powerful affirmation to fall back on and to live from. So let's take a moment to unpack this ideal of motherly love. And to be sure, it is an ideal that both inspires and sometimes haunts us. Anybody have that experience? I know there are times when I didn't show up the way I wanted to as a mother, and, and we could get into a lot of judgment about that. And then there's all the times that we compare our mothers to other mothers and think that we missed out on something. So especially when we conflate the ideal with these actual capacities and skills as they vary and show up in human form at different times in our lives. We can turn to the Daily Word for starters, where Myrtle Fillmore refers to the mother side of God as the divine love that never fails. In essence, the love that consistently nurtures, encourages, and believes in the best part of us, and as was expanded in the first Corinthians reading, is always patient kind and enduring, but never rude, irritable, resentment, resentful, or insisting on its own way. Right? We are. We all live up to that, right? <laughs> and the thing is, this ideal is not limited to Judeo-Christian beliefs. As the scriptures that Colleen read show, Buddhism, for example, is similarly filled with imagery and metaphor of the ultimate love, being like the ideal love of a mother for her child, and compared to universal love, the middle way, and the bodhisattva path. As she stated in the scripture this morning, as a mother loves her child, the bodhisattva loves all beings. Well, amidst all this idealizing, it can be useful to recognize that what actually constitutes good mothering, or good parenting for that matter, is a cultural cliché, varying not just from nation to nation, but from decade to decade and century to century, informed by both myths and misconceptions that shape our thinking, often without conscious awareness. As Peg Street, the author of Daughter Detox, Recovering from an Unloving Mother and Reclaiming Your Life, artistically describes it, if motherhood had a color or a palette, it would be the gentle pastels of Mary Cassatt or August Renoir. If motherhood had a scent, it would be that of roses, lilacs, or lavender. Our idea of motherhood is influenced by images of the Virgin Mary, no matter what our faith, and deeply connected to our most idealistic beliefs about love, as we just described from the scriptures. So this morning, in the interest of helping surface unconscious beliefs and expectations that can get in the way of our self-awareness and our capacity for mindful choices and living that align with our highest understanding of truth, I thought I'd share a little bit about Street's insights into three common myths about motherhood in our culture that often create unrealistic expectations that can interfere with rather than inspire healthy and meaningful motherhood experiences. And while Street doesn't specifically address this, I would add the assumption that motherhood and motherly love are viewed as belonging to the exclusive purview of women as yet another troublesome myth, especially as gender roles are re regarding parenting continue to evolve in our culture. So for our purposes this morning, please note that when I use the term for mother or maternal, I'm not necessarily limiting that experience to women, even as I acknowledge that the myths heavily make that implication, which is part of the problem. So the first myth that she talks about is motherhood is instinctual. She points out that actually humans are complicated creatures, 
And so despite our built-in dispositions to nurture, which we all have, maternal investment in offspring is complicated by a range of considerations, including cultural expectations, gender roles, sex preferences, and conditioned sentiments such as honor or shame that may have been passed down through families or are the results of the specific circumstances around a particular pregnancy and birth. Additionally, since human infants are dependent on their mothers, again, that could be mothers and fathers, parents for years, the parents' vision of the future is a major factor as well. Is this seen as a joyous process or as a burden or something that has limited our lives or something that enhances our lives? Given these and other diverse conditions and conditioning, it's no surprise that individuals come to motherhood with varying degrees of skills and dispositions that result in some individuals feeling expanded by motherhood and others feeling constrained. Unfortunately, this idealized view of motherhood doesn't allow for such ambivalence, doesn't allow us to helpfully explore our feelings and our expectations and our struggles. And that results in all levels of resolve, unresolved internal and external conflicts, as well as relational fallout. So in the process of wanting to be loving, it helps to look at our myths, look at our memories, look at our beliefs. Myth number two is that maternal love is unconditional. As described by the influential American psycho psychoanalyst and philosopher Eric Fromm, who said this, mother's love is bliss, is peace. It need not be acquired. It need not be deserved. How many of us have fallen a little short of that in the middle of <laughs> I know I have both as the daughter and as the mother in, in uh, life. And I sit at dinner with my son sometimes, and they recall the stories and events of when I lost it. <laughs> I look at that as, well, if they can remember them, then there's a, just a few, as opposed to that particular pattern. But, but now they laugh, and, and I try to laugh, too. <laughs> so where to start with this expectation, this myth? Without trying to argue or even explore the various possible meanings and or the validity of the concept of unconditional love in practical terms, the primary fallacy for me in this myth lies in the implied assumption that love of any kind, let alone the kind of love that includes parental responsibility, is primarily a feeling and an automatic one of that versus a choice made daily or hourly or sometimes minute by minute that requires emotional and spiritual maturity and involves setting reasonable, healthy, and meaningful boundaries, and yes, conditions, on our children for their own welfare and their own highest good. So finally, myth number three is the maternal bond is instantaneous and universal. The truth is, for all the reasons discussed in the previous two myths and more, not all mothers bond with their children. And it doesn't take place in the, I love this description, instant super gluey kind of way this cultural mythology suggests. <laughs> instant super gluey way. This is not to say that mother-infant bonding <coughs> doesn't exist. We, a number of us have experienced that powerful connection with our child. But rather that there's a more essential connection between mother and child that is called attachment. And attachment isn't instantaneous, it's a process, a complicated dance of maternal-infant interaction over time on physical, psychological, and neurological levels that requires the mother to become responsive and attuned to her infant's cues. And when they're successful in this, it creates a specific kind of synchronicity that is measurable, pre measurably predictive of the emotional and relational trajectory of that child's life. So it's a powerful commitment that individuals make. It's not something that just happens to flow through our genes because we're women, or even when we're men. The key here is that as a process, <laughs> it's the conscious work of effective motherhood that is emphasized, along with the emotional and spiritual maturity that supports our ability to make such a commitment to motherhood and parenting, versus counting on instinctual, unconditional and instantaneous mothering gifts and capacities to magically appear in our lives the moment a child is born. In short, our expectations of motherhood, whether they are about how our mothers should have shown up for us or how we should show up for our children, are seldom met. They're often met at a great, to a great degree. Many of us have had wonderful experiences with our mothers, but even those best relationships 
I know for me, I found other sources also that filled in the areas and the needs that I had in a given moment or a given time in my life that my mother couldn't be present for. The truth is, we're all works in progress, doing the very best we can. As we say uh, in our circles, sometimes it comes across highly disguised, sometimes it's limited due to wounding and, and, and memories that we've held at, from our own past and lives, but hopefully we're all growing through the process, including expanding our capacity for forgiveness, understanding, and compassion, even as we get to experience and enjoy relationships we have with both our children and our mothers in our lives. And what a relief, and how wonderful it is to realize that we all have access to multiple sources of motherly love in a multitude of forms, including fathers, grandparents, step-parents, in-laws, siblings, aunts and uncles, teachers, coaches, pastors, friends, therapists, and not the least of these our beloved pets, whose unconditional love soothed many a wounded heart and how healing and heartwarming it is to take a moment to remember with gratitude those who have blessed us by sharing the pieces and parts of God's motherly love with us all along the way, and those who have blessed us by graciously receiving the pieces and parts of God's ideal motherly love that we've shared along the way, because we know as we give, we also receive. Part of healing our experiences with our mothers sometimes is becoming mothers. One, we can choose to do things differently, but at least I found more often, I discovered just how wise my mom had become over the 20 years it took me to grow up. <laughs> and most importantly, regardless of appearances, once again, we are now and forevermore one in the love of God. So many people have helped me come to this. The last word by Mr. Rogers. <laughs> So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are. Those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. 10 seconds of silence, I'll watch the time.
haven't already done so, I invite you to get comfortable in your seats. If it's comfortable for you to put your feet flat on the floor so you feel grounded with Mother Earth. Ideally with your hands open, signifying your receptivity to spirit moving in and through you. You can roll your shoulders and release any tension as you get comfortable and close your inner eyes. Let us tell the stories of mothers, stories that could be true. Let us tell of warm mothers, soft and round, likely to be found with flour on their nose and always ready to pour you a glass of milk to go with the cookies on your plate. These mothers are increasingly rare. Let us tell of mothers who are like the bubbles of champagne. They surprise your senses, leave you giggly, but when you least expect it, they erupt with an unexpected pop. Stories that could be true. Then there are grouchy mothers, stressed mothers, exhausted mothers, faces lined with worry and spirits tired and gray. Our mothers are wise and reliable, not prone to many words or to a lot of noise, but you know that when you need them, they'll be there. Let us tell of fierce mothers, the ones who will love you even when you're wrong. Let us also tell of absent mothers, whose memory shimmers at the edges of your heart. Let us tell of distant mothers, cruel mothers, loving mothers, giving mothers. They are the walk-away mothers, save the world mothers, too busy mothers, Mothers who cry because you lost them, and mothers who make you cry because you can't. Stories that could be true. May we hold in our hearts the mothers we have known, those who have loved us, and those who tried. May we forgive the mothers who didn't get it right, and try to release the knots of disappointment, anger, grief, and pain. May we hold in our hearts the truth that mothering, nurturing, is a task that belongs to all of us. However old or young we are, whatever our gender, may we make extra room for nurturing in our lives this week. May we say something real to a harried store clerk, give a coworker a genuine compliment, take time to listen deeply to a friend. And as we take these stories and intentions into a time of shared silence, may we remember and reflect and create a new stories of love and nurture from this point forward, stories that can be true in the silence. as we feel our hearts open wider to the sounds of children right here in our midst, to the laughter and the crying and the struggling and the wiggling. They are reminders of this opportunity for us to nurture, to embrace, to lift up, to appreciate. And so as we bring our attention back to this room and this time, we give thanks now for our birth mothers, for their love and their wisdom, for their guidance and their caring, recognizing that they too are in process, learning and growing into greater capacities of love. And we also give thanks for all the ways that motherly love has embraced our lives through all the other beings, healing us, lifting us, laughing with us, guiding us, teaching us forgiveness, offering us compassion, and helping transform us into a greater capacity to love and lighten the world. So when you're ready, open your eyes, be here present, and together let us say, 